Good afternoon on this Friday, the 27th of January. Thank you for stopping by here at 28storms.com, and this is a cyclone update on Iggy, located to the north of Western Australia. As of right now, we are being presented with a fairly difficult track forecast. This is the latest forecast expectations from the U.S. Joint Typhoon Warning Center. They are expecting the system to strengthen to 95 knots over the next several days, and it looks as though they are still forecasting the storm to take a turn more toward the west just before landfall, whereas if you compare that to the latest forecast from the Bureau of Meteorology, they are taking the storm on a much more easterly track, therefore there would be a greater chance of a landfall. Also notice on the Australian scale they have it intensifying to a Category 3, making this a severe cyclone down the road. But for now, the latest zoomed-in visible imagery reveals that this system is fairly asymmetric. As of right now, there are no signs of any developing eye or eye wall-like feature. And the eastern semicircle of the storm is really cut off here due to some easterly wind shear. All the convection is lopsided over and just toward the west of the center. So it doesn't look like we're going to see much in the way of any significant intensification for at least the next 12 hours. And as we go to the enhanced infrared, we actually had more convection over the storm several hours ago. It looks like the convection is on a slight decline, at least temporarily, but this is to be expected during the afternoon hours. Usually convection is more prominent with tropical cyclone during the late overnight hours. As we turn to the water vapor, we can also begin to make out more signs of that easterly wind shear. And the latest wind shear product from the University of Wisconsin shows that we really don't have the most favorable setup for continued intensification just yet. Just to the north and east of the tropical cyclone, the wind shear values quickly ramp up to an excess of 20 to 25 knots. And as we look at a more detailed evaluation of the mid to upper level pattern, yes, there is a very favorable upper level ridge, but it's located just toward the south of the cyclone at this time. And along the northern side of the ridge, that's the main reason why we're dealing with the easterly wind shear. But as we just saw with the official forecast tracks, it looks as though the system is going to begin moving more toward the southeast. And as long as that upper level ridge remains currently anchored where it is now, then that's going to bode well for this system over the next two to four days. The latest precipitable water animation shows the evolution of our developing cyclone quite well. And toward the end, we get the overall feel that the storm has been moving steadily toward the east-southeast or southeast. And that's going to have to be closely monitored for interest here along Western Australia. And we're going to take a more detailed look at the steering currents in just a moment. But every so often, one additional factor could also alter the forecast track to some extent. Usually when tropical storms are relatively disorganized due to vertical wind shear, the center of circulation does have an outside chance of relocating toward the deeper convection. In this case, as we just saw on the satellite, the convection is more toward the west of the center of circulation. And if it were to relocate more toward the west, then that would certainly be good news. We would have more of a window of opportunity for the system to move away from the coast if it starts deeper out into the ocean. But as of right now, we still have to follow the storm based on where it's currently located and go along with the steering parameters from there. So as we take a look at the latest steering layers, we can see that the Australian ridge is centered across the southern half of the continent. But we also have a very notable trough over the southern Indian Ocean. As you can see, it's beginning to rear its head into the southwest corner of the frame. And it's going to be a matter as to how much this trough is going to really begin to batter the western periphery of this ridge. If the trough begins to move in a little bit quicker and that ridge begins to weaken, then this could allow the cyclone to move more toward western Australia. We can also see the evolution of this pattern not only on the steering layer charts, but also on the mid to upper level water vapor imagery. Here's the coast of Western Australia in the southeast corner of the frame, and we can see the troughiness trying to advance eastward over the southeast Indian Ocean, and we will be closely monitoring how the dynamical models handle the evolution of both of these steering parameters. This is the latest mid-level steering forecast from the ECMWF model, and right off the bat we see the presence of the ridging here across Western and Central Australia. The troughiness is beginning to enter the picture across the southeast Indian Ocean, as we go into day one and day two, this trough is continuing to advance closer toward Western Australia and the ridge is beginning to break down. And we can see, already see here by 48 hours and especially now into day three, the cyclone is beginning to make landfall across the extreme Western portion of the coastline. And just to show that this is a fairly difficult forecast track, anytime the steering currents are not very strong and the storm is only moving very little or hardly any at all, then the models can be fairly inaccurate at times. So this forecast is definitely not edged in stone, 
but the European forecast or the ECMWF is definitely still something to take note of as this is usually our most accurate forecast model. We also usually have added confidence in the ECMWF model forecast when its ensemble members are in agreement with the deterministic run. And the deterministic run is what we just saw and this is located on the right side of the screen. To the left is the ensemble average and as you can see by 72 hours the models both the deterministic and the ensemble average are in fairly good agreement that the system is at least going to clip the coast providing some very significant weather and the same can be said as we go into day four. This is simply a different view of the ECMWF model forecast and as we go into 24 and 48 hours the model is not really forecasting much in the way of any significant intensification and this could be due to the fact that the easterly wind shear may persist for another day or two. But then as we go into day three and day four, despite the cyclone moving very close to the coastline, this is the period in which the model is actually most aggressive with showing continued intensification. And that could be the result of the upper level ridge becoming vertically stacked above the tropical cyclone by this time. Meanwhile, this is the latest zero Z forecast from the GFS forecast model and the GFS is very aggressive with continued intensification beyond the 24 to 36 hour forecast period and also one key difference between the GFS and European is that the GFS is showing more of a curve toward the southwest just off the coastline but still look how strong this system is potentially going to get and despite the storm moving just to the west it looks as though the eastern half of the cyclone possibly even the eye wall if it becomes a severe cyclone will be able to clip the coastline and this is the forecast for 84 in 90 hours into the future. This is another view of the 72 hour GFS forecast and as you can see the center of circulation is forecast to be just offshore but unlike the agreement that we saw between the ECMWF deterministic and its ensembles the GFS doesn't have that luxury. If we go ahead and switch over to the GFS ensembles for the same time frame the GFS ensemble members are actually in more agreement with what we saw with the European members. So this is potential evidence that the operational run of the GFS may be slightly too far to the west. And keep in mind the GFS really was not that far away from the coast as it was. This is certainly something to be considered, especially when we add the Canadian CMC model forecast to the mix. As we set this model into motion, we can see that the CMC is also de developing this cyclone further. And then it does show a landfall with the cyclone making it across the coastline before taking that turn more toward the south southeast. I also just really wanted to quickly include the sea surface temperature product and as you can see the water temperatures are also very favorable for development so once that easterly wind shear does begin to relax I really don't see any reason not to believe that this system will go on to become a severe cyclone as the Australia Bureau of Meteorology is forecasting and as of right now yes there is still a chance that this system bypasses western Australia and makes that quick turn toward the southwest but as of right now there is still just too much evidence to really ignore the threat here especially over extreme western portions of the coastline so all interest in this region should be bracing for a severe cyclone impact as early as within the next 48 to 72 hours right now I think the most likely scenario is somewhere within a blend of the JTWC and Bureau of Meteorology forecast track I really don't foresee this system moving as far east as Port Hedland, although all interests there are still advised to keep up with the official weather forecast. But I do think that this storm is going to begin taking more of a turn toward the south, and right now this is looking like the current bullseye. But again, hopefully that GFS solution is more accurate, and that way we won't have nearly as much to worry about in those areas. Elsewhere, the tropics are generally quiet, at least for now. But the forecast model several days ago did correctly forecast the development of some rather significant precipitation here across the Pilbara and Kimberley coastlines. So we're also keeping a close watch on the precipitation accumulation in those regions. Also, the developing tropical low that was once over Darwin did continue to move more toward the southeast as forecast. So we're really not worried about that system in terms of any cyclone development, of course, being that it's over land but it will have the threat of producing some significant rainfall as it works its way deeper into Queensland and possibly even into New South Wales. There's also some concern in the medium range that we could see some potential cyclone development out into the Coral Sea. 
However, any chance of cyclone development is well beyond the next 72 hours, so it is somewhat questionable as to whether or not it's really going to occur. And even if we did see cyclone development out into the medium range, it is far too early to really determine where the most likely track forecast would be for that system. So that is all for now from us here at 28storms.com. We're going to go ahead and try to update the video blog as often as possible as long as Cyclone Iggy remains a threat. And of course, if any other systems begin to pop up near the Australian coastline, we'll be sure to at least provide discussions available at 28storms.com cyclone. So thank you for stopping by and have a good evening.